Well, good morning, everyone. Glad you're all here with us this morning. I invite you to stand as we enter into worship this morning. Let's sing. Proclaim the goodness of God. Welcome here. Welcome him here to this place. Let's worship him. We've waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of your praise Your presence in this place Your glory on our face We're looking to the sky Descending like a cloud You're standing with us now Lord, unveil our eyes You're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. May this be our prayer. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Oh, lift it up. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens. the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our your glory show us show us your power show us show us your glory Lord. sing that with all your heart show us show us your glory show us show us your power show us Show us your glory, Lord. And that's our prayer this morning, Lord. Would you show us your power? Amen. You may be seated. 
Welcome, welcome to church family. Hopefully you are doing extremely well on what a beautiful morning the Lord has given us this morning. Isn't it amazing? For those that don't know, I'm Andrew. I am the youth director here at NPMC and we are so excited that you're with us. If you are a guest with us this morning, there is a connection form and it's found in the pew in front of you. And there's also a connection form that will be on the screen up here in a second that you can uh, scan and fill it out also. But if you are in the center aisles, if you want to take that attendance book and pass that to the outside corners, that would be wonderful. Pastor Dave will be continuing his series called Crossing Barriers. So if you have your Bibles, just be ready because this is going to be a great one, let me tell you. Uh, the men's breakfast is coming up, and that's this Saturday, April 20th at 8 a.m. in the church cabin, which is right if you turn your heads around. Don't do it, but if you turn your heads around, it's a building right across the way there. Um, I thought I heard my name, but apparently I didn't. I don't know what I'm doing. Um... But this is a time where the men will get to hear the sharing of God's word and a great time of fellowship. There's a sign-up sheet back there in the foyer if you're going to go, come to the event. But also there's a couple things that they still need. So if you want to go back to that table and sign up for the things that you could bring to help them out, that is wonderful. And they want to know that if anyone is invited, so make sure that you can invite somebody if you want them to bring them to this event. But there's all men, there's also a survey put in your mailbox last week. If you haven't checked already, it's in your mailbox. They ask that you fill that out on it's just a kind of a questionnaire on the things that the Lord has gifted you in because the men's ministry really wants to be the hands and feet of the people of NPMC, but also be the hands and feet to the community out there. So this would just help them figuring out who's good at what and who's not good at certain things because we don't want to ask me to do a lot of things because that wouldn't be good. But anyways, so... Um, Make sure you fill that out and bring that to the breakfast. If you can't make the breakfast, just put it in the church mailbox, and then we'll get that to the men's ministry. Hopefully, you look forward to being there. It's going to be a great time. This Wednesday at 6.30, Pastor Dave will be leading a de child dedication meeting, and the, the child dedication will be happening on Mother's Day of this year. Obviously, I don't know why I need to say that. But anyways, um, so talk to Pastor Dave today or call the church office if you plan on being there. And just as a reminder, you need to be at this meeting in order to dedicate your child here at NPMC. And the last announcement is we're going to bring the partitions back that go right there and right there. And they are out there in the storage building. So we need some strong men to come help with moving them from way over there to way up there. So if that's you and you'd be willing to help, just at the end of service, just come here to the front and Obi will be here and then we'll kind of guide you and we'll figure out how we're going to bring those in. So if that's something that you'd be able to help with, that would be great. But let's get me out of here and let's worship the Lord. Ushers, if you want to come forward at this time as we continue in worship through our tithes and offerings. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near. And I will fear no evil. For my God is with me, and if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear, whom then shall I fear? Oh, no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on a glorious light beyond all compare there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes we'll live to know you here on the earth and i will fear no Oh, no, you never let go through the storm and through the 
a light that is coming for the heart that holds on. There will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, still I will praise you, still I will praise you. And I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on And there will be an end to these troubles But until that day comes Still I will praise you Still I will praise you Singing, Lord, no, you never let go Through the storm and through the storm And every high and every low Oh no, you never let go Lord, you never let go of me Lift your voices, proclaim this Singing, oh no, you never let go Through the calm and through the storm Oh no, you never let go In and every low, oh no, you never let go, Lord, you never let go of me. Thank you, Lord. My hope is built on nothing less. Then Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name Christ alone, cornerstone Weak, made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil My anchor holds within the veil trumpet sound Oh may I then in Him be found Dressed in His righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne When He shall trumpet sound Oh may I then in Him be found Dressed in His righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne Christ alone Strong, 
in the Savior's love through the storm He is Lord Lord of all Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's Yeah. 
every promise you ever made. Jesus, you are unfailing. Jesus, you are unfailing. Jesus, you are unfailing. unfailing. Sing that chorus one more time with all of our hearts. This we know, we will see the enemy run. This we know, we will see the victory come. We hold on to every promise you ever made. Jesus, you are Jesus, we trust you. And God, we look to you. And Father, strengthen our spirits this morning as we open your word. Because we want nothing more than to meet with you this morning. So Lord, speak to us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Before you're seated, turn to somebody and say, Jesus is unfailing. Well, good morning. We're glad that you're here today. Last week, we had um, English 101 is what we did last week. We did a little verb and noun uh, work. And today, we're going to deal with something a little bit different. Because I think as we were singing together, it reminded me of something that I have spoken about many times to, to young men who are going into the ministry, uh, who come through the credentialing process. I, I may have even told you this before. Uh, we find that in ministry that... It tends to be short term, unfortunately. Uh, the lifespan of ministry is somewhere in that category of five to seven years. That's the average. So when young men are coming uh, through that process of, of being licensed, serving on that committee, I have an opportunity to just speak into their hearts. It is about their theology, certainly, that we examine as we talk to them. Those are important, they're vitally important. But also one of the things that I try to encourage them along the way is to remember that I'm not always looking at them and saying, here's a five to seven year kind of person. Because sometimes they do last. They, they, they fight through the battles, they get to the end of it all, and, and they finish the race. I wanna say something to you this morning that is awfully critical to my heart this morning. What I say to them is what I'm going to say to you this morning, and that is simply this. I am not fearful that we're going to fail. I'm not. I am fearful that we're going to succeed at the wrong things. This morning, brothers and sisters, we're going to talk about what God's role is the things that only God can do, and to realize then there's the only the things that we can do. Because if we try to do what it is that God alone can do, what we're gonna find ourselves is, is at the end of our journey, we're gonna look back and we're gonna see that we were never gonna be able to accomplish what we thought we would because we were doing the wrong things. So this morning, that's what we're gonna look at together today. So it's to start with, we're gonna go from an English lesson to, to a really old saying that I found and I just found it dear to my heart as I was coming across this. Charles Spurgeon said this back in the 1800s and I'm gonna read it to you now and if you can get past some of, the, some of the older language of it all, you're gonna understand what he's getting at here. So try to read through the lines, if you will, for just a moment and listen to his heart. This is what Charles Spurgeon had to say about his 
view of ministering to other people individually. That's what he's talking about here. He says this. It's a great quote. He says, if I were utterly selfish, what he means is if I could just do, if I could just be what I want to be, this is what he says, and had no care for anything but my own happiness. Now that sounds pretty selfish, does it not? He says, I would choose if I might, under God, to be a soul winner. Now that's old language there for us. You don't hear people saying soul winners anymore. But he, it's a good saying. It should be a saying that we still use today. But he goes on and he says this. For never did I know perfect, overflowing, unutterable happiness of the person of the purest and most ennobling order till I first heard of one who had sought and found a savior through my means. I'm that one link in a chain that made a difference in somebody else's life. That's what he's talking about. No young mother ever so rejoiced over her firstborn child. No warrior was so exalted over a hard-won victory than to be just that a soul winner. To be the link in a chain that, that helps somebody to come to know Jesus Christ. And if you've ever had that privilege, brothers and sisters, of being that link in the chain that drew a neighbor or a friend or a family member to Jesus Christ, then you know exactly what Charles Spurgeon is talking about. There's no greater feeling than knowing that a life has been changed not because of you being so good, but because of your obedience to God that you played a part in that person coming to know Jesus Christ. There is no greater feeling than that. Now, if you've never had that joy, now let me say this to you this morning, and you're longing for it. That's the key. You want to be found faithful. You want to be that link in the chain then I can assure you of this, that as you walk in obedience to God, as you are moved by His Spirit, and please understand, you have to be moved by His Spirit. It is not something that you're equipped to do on your own. Then when He gives us that privilege, then many of you and I will come to understand the statement that Spurgeon just mentioned to us as we read it together. To be a soul winner for Jesus Christ, there's no greater joy there's no greater experience than that. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer and let's get into our time together today. Father, even right now in these moments, as there may be some who are here this morning who say, man, how, how incredibly awkward it is to find ourselves in that place where we're trying to be a testimony, that we're trying to be an example that leads other people to you, Jesus. It's scary for some. It's, it's awkward for some. It's... It's humbling for most. And Father, this morning, what well, my prayer is for, for myself and for, for my brothers and sisters who are here this morning. Father, I pray that you, would, that you would not just enlighten us to help us understand what your role is and what our role is. And they're very different. That Lord, that it would ease the burden, that it would ease that feeling of overwhelmingness in our hearts, that, that Lord, it is not just possible, but it's the calling that you give to us. That Father, this morning, that we might just walk out of these doors today with, with a different attitude about ministry, about a different attitude toward evangelism. That Father, that we would see it in a new light that would give us just a zealous for what it means to be a, a Christ follower to be a disciple, to be a light. Father, would you equip us? Would you open our eyes and our hearts this morning to, to, to hear and to receive what it is that you want us to have today? And Father, I pray that in that time, that Lord, that you would just equip us for all that we need to be for you. And that Lord, that we would look back with great joy, seeing lives changed because of you working in us and through us. Father, help us this morning, we pray. And it's in your precious and the wonderful name of Jesus that we all pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So as we move forward, as where we are this morning, and by the way, we talked about what does evangelism mean. That's what we talked about last week. We talked about the good news. What does that mean? We don't have time to go over that this morning, but I hope that if you haven't 
wasn't with us last week, go back and listen to last week's message. It'll help to equip you and prepare you for where we're going now. But as we move forward, it is critically important that we understand that evangelism is supremely God's work in people. It's what he's doing. It's not, it's not what we just read a book and somehow we are equipped and we go out and we do it. It, it. it is certainly the book. It's the Bible. But it is the spirit of God that works in us and through us which allows us to be used. That he enlists us. He, he draws us into this opportunity that he calls us to to be a light in the darkness. And I can tell you this morning that this thing that he calls us to is not because he needs us. Just like how he created the universe. He, he created that which was darkness and turned it into light. He made us from nothing. He made Adam from nothing. Folks, if he would want to, he could choose in his own divine ability to draw people unto himself, and he would not require you to do a thing. He wouldn't require me to do a thing. But he decides that that's not the way that it's going to be. He chooses to use us. He chooses to equip us to do the work that he's called us to. And just as he came into the world in the person of Jesus Christ, and now that Jesus has gone back to heaven... He now says to you and to me, now I'm going to choose you to do a work by the means in which you live your life, by the means in which you have a lifestyle to reach other people for the cause of Jesus Christ. Those of us who have been transformed by the work of Jesus Christ in, his, in our lives are going to be used to minister to those who do not know you into this dark, dark world. So while we recognize that God saves and God only saves, he doesn't just do so in isolation from us, but he uses us. And Paul tells us that, that we recognize that he also has ordained by the means of men and women to come to salvation, therefore enlist us in this process. So the right beginning for all of this this morning, and what it means is that we're called to be involved in evangelism. And in recognizing in this, the feeling of our responsibility is to be obedient to this thing that we call the Great Commission. <laughs> this thing that he calls us to be a part of. And we must be clear, folks, this morning, that as we think about what is the Great Commission, what is it that only God can do, and what is it that only we can do? And that's what I want to talk about this morning. So if you're taking notes this morning and you want to kind of begin our time together by having some kind of guide, maybe you can just write this down. We're going to talk about a few things that only God can do. That's kind of our heading this morning. What God alone can do. That's what we're going to talk about today. And therefore, what other, the other side of that equation is, what is it that only we can do? That's what we're going to talk about. And if only God can do certain things, right? I mean, if we're talking about this and we say there are just certain things that only God can do, then we might be tempted if we're not careful to go out and with the best of intentions, go out and try to do things that we're not supposed to do. To go out and do things that we thought was our responsibility to do. And if we do those things, we're going to find ourselves, as I said at the very beginning, not failing but succeeding at the wrong things or, or failing at the wrong things as well, however you want to look at it. And then we become disappointed because we've spent all of our time trying to do these things that we were never equipped to do and theologically we were never told it was our job to do. That's what's key this morning. I think there are a lot of people who look at evangelism and look at what they do and they say, I thought it would work. I thought we could succeed in this. And realize it was never your job in the first place to do what you're trying to do. That doesn't make sense right now, I know. But I pray that in just a moment it will begin to make sense. So let's take a moment today and look at some of the things that only God alone can do. So here's the first the first thing that only God can do is conviction of sin, and that is the work of God and of God alone. That's the only one who can do that. The conviction of sin is the work of God, not us. Now, one of the questions, and I hate to tell stories, 
Because I've only been at one church for the, for the majority of my ministry, and that is here. And so every story that I have originates from my encounter with people here. So when I normally would enjoy being at one place for five years and go to another church, I can tell your stories five years from now, but I don't get to do that. So this morning, I'm gonna tell you a story that happened here. I won't use names, because I'm way too smart for that. But I wanna tell you a story that as it was told to me, I thought, it's not just that person's story, it's really the story of many people. But they just don't wanna share it, they just don't wanna say so. So this is kind of how their question came about. They came about and they said, you know, I was talking to, and I can't say that name because that person also was part of this church now, so I can't go there either. But you fill in the blank. I was talking to Tom or I was talking to Betty, whatever you want to use, and I was telling them about the gospel. So far, not a bad thing. Doing the right thing. And I mentioned this whole thing about sin, they said talking about sin, talking about what sin looked like, and they said to me, you know, now that you bring up this whole sin thing, you know what, I think I know what you're talking about. I've heard of the sin thing, I just don't have it. Oh, I've, I've heard about people who are sinners, but I don't happen to be one of them. Now this person who's telling me this story says, you know, immediately what happened was I got very concerned because this didn't sound right just as you didn't think it sounded right when you responded just now. So they felt pressed. They felt pressed to begin to look at them and say, now let me tell you, you've got some faults. And let me tell you, you've got some inconsistencies. Now let me ask you, in that very moment, how do you think they responded? Lovely, right? Yes. Tell me more. Tell me more about my inconsistencies. Oh no. They didn't seem to want to hear it, they said. And so... By the time that I got to the good news, they didn't want to listen at all. And, and from the wor great words of that theologian, and I'm trying to think of his name, he always said this, and I can't remember, you, you, I think it was Gomer that said this. It was, surprise, surprise. Am I wrong? <laughs> well, surprise, surprise, you got that right. Of course we shouldn't be surprised by that, right? But here's the problem. With the best of intentions, when that person said to them, I've heard of sin, but I don't have it, or I've heard of sinners, but I'm not one of them, the reaction is, is now I have got to prod after you, and I've got to show you just what you are. Do you see the problem there? That's what only God can do. There's the part that God does and there's the part that we do. It doesn't mean, brothers and sisters, that in righteous judgment that we don't go to our brothers and sisters to point out what the word of God says. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about conviction, what only God can do. And that's what, John, that's what, that's what Jesus says. Uh, let me just read it to you. John chapter 16, I think this just, it spells it out perfectly for us. In John chapter 16, verse seven, it says this. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Jesus says, it is really important that you understand that even though you think right now this is a bad thing that I'm leaving, I want to tell you this is a good thing. Because unless I go away, the advocate, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Why? Because when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because people Here's, a, here's something you may have never seen before. Because people do not believe in me. <laughs> and it's interesting, folks. I don't say it's the greater of sins. I'm saying if, if you put all sin together and you sum it up to one single thing, here it is. The ultimate sin is that the sin of unbelief. It is the sin of not believing in God. That's, if you sum up everything, that's where it ends. That's where it lands. Now, the natural man doesn't expect that, and nor does he accept that. But it is true. And that's what it says. He says, he says in regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, he says, in regards to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. 
And the Father is the one who sends the advocate to point to us and to say, ah, you need to know what's in your heart. Now, that's number one. So God alone can bring conviction of sin. Number two, God alone can give repentance to men and to women. Think about it. How, how in the world is an un repentive, upright, you can think about these per- people who are in your community, in your life, these people who are upright, dignified, well-meaning members of society, people that you work with on a regular basis, who work in your office, or live on your streets, or wherever you know, they find themselves, how do they ever get down on their knees and acknowledge that they are helpless? What is it that brings them to their knees? To point out that they're helpless sinners before God. What is it? unless God grants repentance. That's what it is. And brothers and sisters this morning, when the apostles walked into the birth of the church in Acts chapter five, and we're gonna look at it in just a second. In Acts chapter five, Peter is proclaiming the responsibility that he has to obey God rather than demand. And then Peter begins to give them a whacking. We call that a spanking for those of you parents who've never tried that before, but it's called a whacking or a spanking. And they're about to get another one. And Peter then says this in verse 30 of chapter 5. Look at this. In Acts chapter 5, verse 30, he says, The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead. So far it's okay, but here's where it gets hard. Whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior. That he might, what is it? That he might bring Israel to repentance in forgiveness of sin. It's a great word, is it not? The Jewish people, of whom Peter, by the way, was part of, they're sitting there and they're recognizing that they have been involved. They've been involved in an event that was far beyond their understanding. They didn't see what was coming. And Peter doesn't mince any words concerning their responsibility and their part in it. Yet at the same time, Peter says, all this has been at no surprise to God, and by the way, it's also been the purpose of God. Everything that happened, you hung him on a tree, but that was part of his plan. It wasn't just you made it up. It wasn't you designed it. It was all part of his plan so that he might grant repentance. Folks, that's what only God can do. Number three, only God can draw men and women to Jesus. We discover that in John chapter 6. It's a verse that you may not have known where it came from, but you've heard it many times over. John chapter 6, verse 45. No one can come to me unless the Father sent him who draws them to me. That right? You've heard that before? Think about all the things that you could say and what you understand about the Bible, all the things that you could say about Jesus, all those things that you could ever begin to think about. But how in the world is a person ever in deep, in their, in their inner being, going to come to an acknowledgement of Christ Jesus. <laughs> Unless the Father who sent me draws them. That's what he does. And Paul says the same thing. Paul says this in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. He says, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory. Displayed, he says, in the face of Christ. In other words, when he created the world, when God created the world and God said, let's turn the lights on. He literally in that moment turned the lights on. And so there was day and so there was night. And Paul says, the same God that turned the lights on in a natural way has turned the lights on in a spiritual way as well. Because in the midst of that darkness came this light. He turned the lights on in our spiritual darkness. He made his light to shine in our hearts. He gives us the light of knowledge of the glory of God. And where has that light pointed to? Did you see it at the very end? In the face of Jesus Christ. That's that's what only God can do. Don't miss this, brothers and sisters. This is important because people will say, well, if I want to find Jesus, if I want to find God, I can just go up on a mountaintop and sit on a mountain for a while and I'm sure I can find God. 
Or, you know, I'll just go into the, I'll go into the woods somewhere and sit on a rock and look down on my knees for a while and certainly and look up and maybe I think I can find God. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, listen, there's no question. There's not one question about the fact that you might be able to ponder the fact that you were created in a divine way, in the image of God. You may be able to look in the heavens and say, I realize that I I could have never made what I see. I realize that there's probably something greater than me that's created all of this. You may be able to do that. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there will never come, there will never come to saving understanding of God until God turns a light on in your heart. It will never, saving understanding of God will never come until he turns that light on in your heart until Jesus flashes on your heart of mine and yours. No salvation can take place, nothing. They may be nudged closer to the kingdom. They may move from being an atheist to an agnostic, you know. I can take a God, maybe I can't take a God, you know. Maybe there is, maybe there's not. They may even embrace the idea of religion. But John says, here's the good news. It will only come. Understanding of Jesus will only come because of what God does. And here's what, here's what we hear in John chapter 1, verse 12. He says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, that light pointing to Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. That's you and me, brothers and sisters. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision. It's not because you and I are great thinkers that we came to this understanding or husbands' wills, we weren't, we weren't guided that way by other people, but we were born of God. Now here's the point, what, what, why is it so necessary this morning, brothers and sisters, that you knew all this about, about what God alone can do? You might be saying, Pastor, is this just filler? Is this just filler this morning for, for the next 15 minutes that we can now talk about us? No, it is critically important and let me tell you why it's so important. Because this takes the monkey off of your back and mine. When you stop and you think about it, in regards to personal evangelism, isn't that what it does? I mean, I want you to think about tomorrow, okay? I wrote this down again. You already have it in your notes, but I'm just gonna say it to you again. I want you to imagine tomorrow. We're going to have to go out amongst our friends. We're gonna have to go out amongst those that we work with. And now you've got to say to yourself, do I need to convict them of sin? That was the first thing we talked about. Do I need to bring them to repentance? Do I need to draw them to Christ? Do I need to reveal Jesus to them? Do I need to make sure that they're born again? All those things that I just mentioned are the things that we just talked about. Then what a hill that we realize that we would have to climb. That's what we would have to be able to do tomorrow. When you go to the water cooler and you're talking to your neighbor, you're talking to your coworker, you're talking to your family, and you say to yourself, how can I ever bring them to Jesus Christ if all these things are up to me? No wonder evangelism is so hard. But when we realize that it's what God alone can do and knowing what only we can do, and I don't say this flippantly this morning, but hear me out when I say that we can go to bed tonight and we can look up at heaven and we can say to God, man, we have got a big day ahead of us tomorrow. Oh, but God, you've got a bigger day. <laughs> because what you have to accomplish, what only you can do is far bigger than whatever it is that I've got to do. Because this is about you, Lord. This is about what only you can do. Now you're going to say, wait a minute, Pastor, you just said at the very beginning of this message that he chooses to use us. And you're absolutely right, he does. So that means that if he chooses to use us, that means that we have a part in this, right? So let's talk about that. What is our part? That's the key, the second key. And so if you wanna write this down just as a help, here's our preparation for the work, okay? We must be clear as to what it is that God requires of us. So the first word or the first phrase is, we need to be prepped for the work. If we're going to be prepared for, for the work of evangelism, then our lives need to be open to God. And cleansing, sought out of known sins that are in our lives, brothers and sisters, 
need to be dealt with. It would be like a surgeon who's about to perform open heart surgery and he reaches his hand out and he asks for a scalpel and when the scalpel is placed in his hand, he looks at it and it is dirty as all get out. Now let me ask you a question. Does the surgeon choose to use the scalpel? Does he, does he say, it's no really big deal. It doesn't look good. It's probably not even been functioning well, but I'll go ahead and use it. No. The, if a good surgeon chooses to do the right thing, he takes the, he takes the scalpel and he gives it right back and he says, give me a clean one. In many ways, brothers and sisters, that's what God says about us. God is not in the business of using dirty instruments to do his work. Some of us think that because we come to church on Sunday morning, and as long as we sing some songs together, that we can go out in our lives and we can do things that nobody else knows about, those known sins that we have in our lives. But it's okay. I'm going to go now, and I'm going to go minister to somebody, and I'm going to lead them to Jesus Christ. And let me ask you, do you think God looks down and says, yeah, I'll choose to use you? No. It is about a cleansing. It is about us dealing with our own lives and making sure that we are where we need to be because brothers and sisters, this is not for the faint of heart. You can't go out, and by the way, can I just tell you something? This is not part of what I was gonna say today. I don't mean to sound horrible when I'm about to say next, but I just feel like that this is part of the reason. Part of the reason why some people choose not to do evangelism. Part of the reason why some people don't wanna share Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that this is everyone. But brothers and sisters, I believe this morning that there are a lot of people that find themselves in this place. The reason why they find it hard to do evangelism is not because they have a misunderstanding about what the good news is or, or about who God is. But isn't it really hard to do evangelism? Isn't it really hard to, to lead your neighbor or your friend or your coworker to Jesus Christ and you're telling them about sin and you know that deep down inside of you, you know that the things that you're doing look a lot like what they're doing? Why would we ever want to bring, call somebody to something when we're not even there ourselves? I think that's a huge reason why people don't discipleship and walk alongside of other people. It's pretty hard to disciple when you're doing the same things that they're doing, that your life looks pretty much the same. Why would you? Conviction-wise, it would draw you away from doing something like that. Well, God's not in the business of that. In fact, to say it another way, the surgeon issue with the dirty instruments and all that, it's not exactly what Paul's talking about in 2 Timothy chapter 2. In fact, he uses a different analogy. He's talking about the different articles that are in the house. Let me just read it to you so you can get a better picture of it. But 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 20, he's basically saying the same thing I just mentioned, but he's talking about it in a different way. He says, in a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. So he's kind of using a distinction between things that are, are, are profitable and good and things that aren't so good. Some are, are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments of special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. It's a silly notion, isn't it, loved ones, that we would, that would be vitally used of God if we're living dirty lives? I mean, it seems odd that that would be the case. If there's known sins in our lives, areas that we're, we're sneaking away into, things that we're doing on a daily basis, but yet we feel called to do a work, no. You see, we can't go one step beyond repentance in a relationship before we can ever be used by God to reach other people. We are gonna be prepared, and brothers and sisters, we need to be prepared in our own hearts as well. And by the way, here's the second thing. We must be living in the fullness of the Spirit. Can I just tell you that that's something that we don't talk a whole lot about. People don't speak about it very much, but Jesus says this in the very beginning of the church. He says, look, in Acts chapter one, verse eight, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That, may be, that might in many, many ways seem very straightforward to you, but let me tell you this morning, brothers and sisters, it is very important. It is no light thing that he says, wait, because I'm sending you the Spirit. There's a lot of Christians running around trying to do everything in their own strength. 
There's a lot of Christians who are running around that are unequipped. Now here's where I get myself in trouble. And I'm apologizing for this up front. Because when I don't like to be told that I get the senior discount until I am a senior, (laughs) I've set myself up for about what I'm going to tell you now. I didn't even know what it was called until this morning Pastor Matt and I were talking about it uh, in my office before anybody got here. Growing up, my grandmother was pretty frugal. And, and I really never had a lawnmower per se. But I had a real mower. Now, when I say real, I don't mean like an authentic or like, like not a made up version. But when, when we say a real lawnmower, I'm talking about something that's got two wheels and a blade in the middle of it that is, that is pushed by horsepower of a man or a woman or a child that's way too young to have to. No, no never mind. That's another story. I'm bitter. Uh, but... I remember using that tool. And I remember it being about this wide and mowing an acre. Now, now I know what you're thinking. Oh, Pastor Dave, yeah, and I bet you went to school in the snow uphill both ways. No, I'm serious. You can measure my property. My mom still lives there today. It's an acre. And I mowed it by hand with probably about a 20-inch blade. It was tough. And then I got this other thing that my grandma bought and it had four wheels on it and it had a motor on top. Now don't make fun of me because I really thought that all, if I couldn't start it, all I had to do was push it and the blade would turn and I could cut the grass that way. I was young. I was only like 18 years old. So I'm pushing. (laughs) No. But I was pushing it and I was pushing and I gotta tell you, the grass is like this high. And I'm just pushing and pushing. And one day my grandpa, he comes up to me and he says, you know what? That thing would work a lot better if you would pull that pulley there. My face is all red. I'm buckled down. I'm barely getting by. You know, it's 108 degrees out. I don't know what it is. But anyway, I'm just barely getting through. And he says, you know, you're trying to do all the work. But if you pull that pulley, you start that motor. Oh, you're going to see a difference. Brothers and sisters, when we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, I can't tell you the difference that it makes when we reach out to people. When we try to do a work that, to be honest with you, that we're so unequipped to do, but with the Holy Spirit's power, with his strength, can I tell you, man, that yard gets mowed. Things happen. And at the end of the day, God does not call us to be active without providing the power that is necessary for us to reach people who are lost, to get the job done. He knows, can I just tell you, let me say it very honestly to you. God knows how fearful it is to us to reach people. He knows how hard it is. He knows that it's not comfortable to tell people, you know what, I think, that you're, I think that you're searching for something, and I just need to tell you, I, I have an answer for what you're searching for. That's not always easy to tell people, especially in our world today, that rejects it. But I can tell you, that's why he equips us. That's why he gives us the Holy Spirit, to give us the boldness, to equip us, to give us exactly what we need for the purpose that is ahead of us. So in the church, the prep that is needed to be done is that there needs to be a confession of our sins, right? That's first of all. And a cry to God to pour out the fullness of his spirit so that we can do the job that has been called upon us to do. That's number two. The third one is this. An awareness of our our dependence upon the Lord Jesus. Remember... Our need for Jesus is, is found, that, that, just remember this, it's that which Jesus did that found us. We didn't find him. He, he put his arms around us. We didn't put our arms around him. He lifted us up. We didn't lift him up. He brought us into shelter. We didn't invite him into the shelter. And I think there's a reason for that. And I think the reason is that we might not forget lest we become smug, lest we become self-satisfied or opinionated about somehow, you know what, look at us. Look how good I am. I am am new, but look 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 at the kind of new that I am. I'm a better new than a lot of the new. And you can't begin to know what I know about Scripture. You, You can't begin to know how articulate I am You can't begin to know how consistent I am. No. 
lest you become smug and selfish and prideful about what you think you are, you remember who lifted you up. You remember who put their arms around you, what you were and what you would be without him. Uh, I'm gonna be wrong, I think, and so I apologize for this. I never, when I went to Bethel College, I didn't live on campus, but many years later, my son did. And so he's at Bethel, at that time, Bethel College, Bethel University today, and he told me a story. Now, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna see Trevor today, so I'm gonna ask him to be sure that he wasn't just blowing me smoke. But this is what he told me. And if I lived on campus, can I tell you what a draw it would be to go to Bethel? He said that there are certain times at night when there is this red light that comes on. And it comes on over at Krispy Kreme Donut Shop. Now again, he could be telling me a story, but he said when the light comes on, you get free stuff. Has anybody heard that before? Okay, good. So he's not making it up? I thought for sure he was making it up. <laughs> why do I tell you that? Here's why. Because just like a lot of college students probably feel like, man, when that light comes on, what do you do? Call up your friends and say, hey, you got to get over here. Man, they're handing out good stuff over here. Here's, the, here's what you need. Come on. Can I tell you, brothers and sisters, that's what we're talking about here too. It's about us looking at our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers and saying, hey guys, you gotta come over. You gotta, you gotta come. You're not gonna believe what this is gonna do for you. I mean, you're gonna gain about 30 pounds at college, but man, it is gonna be a fun ride doing it. And it's gonna be the best thing you've ever tasted. And it's free. <laughs> and guess what, brothers and sisters? to your friend, to your neighbor, to your coworker. That invitation is there. And all you've got to do is say, hey, listen, I'm not here to tell you how bad you are. I'm not even here to tell you that I can see the badness in you or the sin in you. But I want you to come over here with me because I want you to know this is, this is what I found and it is the best thing going. And it is free for you and it's free for me. And I'm not in any way, please, no emails this week. In no way am I comparing Krispy Kreme to Jesus. <laughs> he tastes better. He lasts longer. It's eternal. And if we get all jacked up about Krispy Kreme, can you imagine how we ought to get jacked up about Jesus Christ? How good he is to taste the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives and be able to say, this is it right here. I pray this morning that you walk out of these doors today, that you take the load off of your back, let the monkey go, because brothers and sisters, the hard work is what God can do, only what God can do. We're just called to be obedient, to cleanse our hearts, to make sure that you're not living a life that isn't adequate, that's dirty, so that God might use you to the fullest. Allow yourself to be equipped by the Holy Spirit, to give you the power that you need, to point people to that which is the best thing coming. Now, I know it's already 11 o'clock. Two more things, and I, these are only gonna be about 20 minutes each, and so be ready. Uh, <laughs> but I do wanna say two more quick things, and, they're gonna, and, and I didn't even have these in my notes, but I added them this morning, and so let me just throw them out to you. I could have added these to the list, but it was gonna take too long. The first thing is this. We need to also humble ourselves as well. I know I talked about it a little bit a moment ago. Before we become experts, I'm gonna say that again. Humble yourself before you become experts. Because some of you, that's what you think of yourself as Christians. You are experts. Like, like you are good. Like, you're not only good, but people look at you and they say, he's good, or she's good. And some of us fall into the trap of believing that we're good. But just remember, brothers and sisters, to humble yourself first, to remember that apart from what he is in you, I can tell you what you are. And it's not good. And it's not what I am either. But we somehow come up with this conclusion that because we have arrived, that now we're something special. The only reason why we're special is because of the way he looks upon you and me. But left to our own accord, you know how special you are. 
You know what you're capable of if you are not following the Lord Jesus Christ, if the Holy Spirit's not residing in your heart and convicting you. You know where your heart leads you. Brothers and sisters, I know where my heart leads me to. And the last thing, real quick, is knowing the word. Can I tell you, it is the emphasis behind everything that we do here at MPMC. That is not arrogance that we say that. What I tell you is this, is that if the only time you open your Bible up, brothers and sisters, is Sunday morning when you come through these doors, you are not equipped to be a Christ follower. You need to continue to be a student of God's word so that you know what his truth is. So when people say, I have a question about this, and you say, well, you know, I'm sure it's there somewhere. I, I've heard somebody say something like that. It's like, a, you know, God helps those who help themselves. Yeah, it's somewhere in there, you know, some stupid, crazy stuff like that. You know that's not in the word, but somebody could say that and say, yeah, that, I, I'm sure we've heard that. It's a saying. I'm sure it's in the Bible. It's a good saying. It's, it's lasted, you know, the test of time. It's got to be biblical. God doesn't help those who help themselves. God helps those who come to the end of themselves. And brothers and sisters, unless you know the word of God, you'll never be able to be what you're called to be for Christ. Let the word of God become your, the food that you eat, that which you hunger for. Because if you don't miss NCIS, every Wednesday or Tuesday night, whatever night that comes on, or whatever show it is that you love, you're so, you're so committed to making sure you don't miss it, don't miss time in God's word either. Because that will far last you and give you what you need for this journey that's ahead of you. Evangelism is not easy, but it doesn't have to be extremely hard either. But you have to be ready. I have to be ready. And when we choose not to be, whether we're left, left to, to not fulfill what we've called to be in our lives, left to not do what God has given us the calling to do. And then we become just dirty instruments that, you know, at the end of the day, it's there, but it's not useful. Let's be useful for the kingdom. Let's, let's be useful for the gospel's sake. Because brothers and sisters, if Jesus Christ truly does reside in your heart, then as Spurgeon said, there is no greater joy than to know that people look at you and say, something different about you. It's not because of you. I, I gotta go. Um, you gotta go too, I'm sure, but there's a lady that I met at the Goshen Hospital. She's a volunteer, so she can basically say whatever she wants, and she has no fear about getting in trouble and getting fired. And so when I come into the hospital, which I go to Goshen Hospital a lot, I went up to her one day, and there's a rule that they have at the Goshen Hospital. And she says this rule is, is that, well, there was a rule, that they could only have a certain amount of people in a room on a given day. And back then, the limit was like two or three or something like that. And, and she said, but you're a pastor? And I said, yeah, I'm a pastor. She goes, well, you don't count. So every time I go to the hospital to go visit somebody, she says to me, as she gives me my little, you know, my little thing to put on my, my shirt so people know, she goes, just remember, you don't count. I love her. I think she's even going to come and visit us. We won't invite her after that, though. No, we will. We will. We'll, we, we, we will, Larry, won't we? We'll, we'll keep her coming. Anyway, here's what I want to say to you. Before she knew who I was, and this has been a long time ago, and I, I, I don't say this to... I don't say this to somehow do this. I just walked in and, and I said good morning and I said thank her. I, I thanked her on the way out. And by the way, that was a good note right there. I'm yeah. sorry. No, that's good. <laughs> it was a joke. It was, I was coming to the, be ready. I'm not there yet. Um, but she says to me, she says, I don't know you. She says, but are you a pastor? And I said, well, yeah, I am. She goes, you look like a pastor. She goes, you act like a pastor. And I didn't know what that meant for a little while, but I know this, what we say, what we do, people see it, even when you least expect it. You will never be prepared to be that until we deal with these things that we just mentioned this morning.
Okay, I have a lot of other things I want to say, but I'm going to have to wait. Would you stand with me this morning? And let's sing together today. And by the way, listen, hey, I, we're here today and we're praying and we're singing together. These altars are open. There's a place in your heart where you say, man, I got to tell you, I have struggled with this whole thing of discipleship. I, I feel so overwhelmed with it, but I have such peace now. You want to just give God glory because now you know that this is not just about you. It's about what he does through you. You know, you need to pray about things. The altars are open. But let's leave today being encouraged, knowing that, that our Father in heaven has given us everything that we need for the journey that's ahead of us. Oh, how I look forward to what God is going to do. Let's sing together this morning. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still. Precious blood of Christ. No, no guilt in life, no fear in death. But this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand till he returns or calls me home. My buddy, uh, Obi Overholzer, is right down here. Um, raise your hand up and go like this, like you just don't care, Obi. Uh, he'll be ready for any of you folks, guys, women, we are not prejudiced, that want to help to bring those dividers back over here. You do not have to lift them. They're going to be on four-wheel carts. No back problems are needed. We'll take care of that part. But I want to say to you real quickly, and I know that Obi says the longer you go on, the less help we're going to get. I just want to tell you that you and me, all of us have played a part in this. We have seen that link in the chain that have, that have 
help people to come to know Jesus and to grow in their faith. Yesterday, we were at a wedding and we watched one of the young girls of our church. She was so young when, when they came. Her name is Katie. And I couldn't help but look at her yesterday thinking about her standing there getting married to Lucas. And I thought to myself, all I can see is this little girl who's, who's jumping off of a chair during quizzing. Just this little thing. And, and I think about the girl that she has grown up to be. And I think about what you have done. I think about the relationship that we get to have. I think about, I'm so proud. I see, like, here's a young man. He's so young, but not that young. He's just become a love of mine. And, and, and I watch him every Sunday. He helps out with our, our, our praise team. And it's just such a joy to watch them grow, is it not? Here's Livy, who's turned 20 years old today. She was a little thing. She wasn't Happy even birthday. born. <laughs> I look across here, and I look at all of our young people. Gosh, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that I got to watch you grow, to be what you are right now, and look ahead and think what God is going to do. And that is not because we ignored the opportunities to invest, but just to love on you and show you Jesus. And wow, I pray that he just continues to allow us those opportunities every single day. What a great opportunity. No, No victory in this world is greater than being a link in a chain that brings people to Jesus Christ. Okay, we gotta be done here because you guys are carrying on. <laughs> Cry babies, let's pray. <laughs> Father, we are so very thankful for today and we are thankful for your word that reminds us of your truth, of what you have called us to be and the joy of seeing you work in us and through us to see other lives changed and transformed for the goodness and the glory of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for these precious moments. Last for eternity. You're so very faithful. Lord, be with us as we leave this place. Be with those hands that help bring those dividers back. Father, thank you for the good help that we get here. Father, be with us now as we leave. We give you glory and we give you praise. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you.